Our next plenary speaker is Dr. Joe DeBook, Senior Vice President of EMIC. Today, and his talk today is Game Changing Opportunities for Wireless Personal Healthcare and Lifestyles. Dr. DeBook has been the head of the unit Smart Systems and Energy Technology since 2009. Dr. DeBook received his engineering degree in 1986 and his Ph. degree in 1991 from the University of Leuven. In 2005, he became the director of Holst Center in Eindhoven, where he pioneered a unique open innovation ecosystem in the field of ultra-low power sensor systems for healthcare and lifestyle. Please join me in welcoming Dr. DeBook. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'd like to start with a little anecdote. Uh, I was talking to one of my colleagues yesterday who flew in from Europe, and he was waiting in the immigration service. And when he stepped up to the immigration officer, he was quizzed about what he was com coming to do in America. And he said, well, uh, I'm going to come to the ISSC. Oh, also, you're going to that conference as well. So the immigration officer sort of knew that there's uh, plenty of you guys coming to this, uh, to this meeting, which is, uh, which is nice on its own, but the real interesting thing is that this uh, immigration officer said, and uh, so you're also going to work on health care. <laughs> so at least there's one person out there who is expecting quite a bit of us. And uh, he's probably going home and saying, all of these engineers coming to San Francisco to finally change our healthcare care system. <laughs> so how's that for a challenge? But one thing is definitely happening, and we will see a revolution in healthcare care as we've seen it over the past decades in wireless communication. And um, I think it's fun to be in that uh, time frame. And this presentation intends to give part of a solution or a possible solution to make healthcare more efficient, more effective for all of us. And it is in the wireless sphere. And the, um, the challenges I, I'd like to address in this presentation have to do with ambulatory monitoring, monitoring on the move. And it's a technical conference, so I'll give a few of the challenges we see ahead of us and quite a bit of the papers and the sessions and the fora in this uh, conference are going to address a lot of those. And then let's see what scenarios are. What is the game of healthcare? And how this technology can change that game. And I hope it inspires you, as it, as it does all of our colleagues, to, uh, to make a difference. Now, typically, the motivation of doing something in healthcare is cost. And it's a a very often used motivation, and it's very correct, that we try to move healthcare from the, the, the care unit or the hospital where we have helped to make healthcare very efficient but also very expensive, to move that to the residential area, to the doctor's practice, and to the home. And when we do so, we will see that we can reduce the cost by just simply having less patients in the hospital and cared at home and in nursing centers, and also we'll improve the quality of life of the, of the patients. They prefer to be at home, of course, rather than be in the hospital. So reducing cost means that you have to do a lot of monitoring. And I think Tim made an excellent case in monitoring, for instance, your heart after surgery. And that, that has to be done in a setting of a day-to-day -day life and very monitoring and monitoring an ambulatory setting. And therefore, we'll need, um, well, low-power devices and low-power circuits, which we'll address in the next uh, part of the, of the talk, but we also, see, also need monitoring devices and devices that will coach us in order to improve our health and improve our lifestyle. So that's been used often, but this is uh, as, a, as a motivator for this type of work. But here's an interesting one, which I think is, is really going to the key of the matter. And here's a patient reflecting on health care. And it says, well, you know, given my status, what is the best outcome I can hope for and how do I get there? What is the most efficient way to get there? And this is a quote from Jamie Haywood, who was giving a presentation at TED, at TED. And he was discussing, he was discussing his uh, brother. He, he was uh, diagnosed with ALS. And he monitored his brother's um, functionality until he deceased a couple, uh, a couple of years ago. And he noticed that when you look at this continuation of this disease, that there's different functions on the body that are changing and the, the mood of the patient and the way he feels or sleeps or behaves is changing continuously. And he notes also that these patients, he's not alone. 
there is this network, there's this whole community of patients that actually are dealing day to day with the same problems. And this leads to the need of these patients to interact. And one of the websites which is coming up, one of these social networks of, uh, of such patients is the patients like me. And I urge you to go to that, uh, to that website and see how this community is answering the most frequently asked question. How are you feeling today? The question that your medical doctor asks you when you come to her or his practice to see how you have been over the past couple of weeks. But this website answers this question on a day-to-day -day basis. And these patients are self-reporting the way they feel in their disease pattern, which medication they take, and how they react on that. And just a snapshot of such a logbook, and again, check it out yourself, but you'll see the type of answers they give, the self-reported data they give to this, and it's, it's a very precise logbook, so to speak. And I was really amazed to see the level of detail on prescription drugs, the one they take or took, why they stepped away from it. And needless to say that uh, not only that information, but also quality of life, prescription drugs I mentioned, equipment, procedures, and all of the symptoms they have in their disease are mentioned. Now this is very, very powerful. It's powerful for the patients. But it's also powerful for, say, the pharmaceutical industry. It's powerful for the doctors. And all of the healthcare community are discovering the way that these patients are dealing with their problem. And a lot of that is to do with, again, how are you feeling? But looking at that from, say, an engineering point of view, the problem with that is it's not all data. It's a lot of information, but it's not all data. So one of the angles we can take on the problem of ambulatory monitoring is to see where we can help to improve the quality of life, to, to improve the networking of these patients by providing them with non-obtrusive and very easy to handle ambulatory monitoring. So, Here's man on the move, and there's a lot of things we can measure on the body. And some of them will help uh, very acute problems, and some of them are just daily parameters, like vital signs. And so I'd like to you know, pose a challenge to the audience, and the challenge is the one of the health patch. Listening to your heart, again, Tim made a good case. It's a very important um, vital sign monitoring we can do, and it'll give, give us signals of many um, um, happenings and many health-related problems we have. The market specifications, or rather the patient's and nurse's specifications, you'll find on this slide, and it's a, it's a long list of, uh, of topics to check. At wearability, of course, comfortability, disposable. It has to be real medical data. It's not a fitness belt. It has to have full EKG, and also warning of, for instance, heart attack or uh, occurring problems. So the early warning uh, is, is an important feature, and it leads to complex algorithms, which, of course, will be a challenge coming up. And then it has to be okay for active life, meaning in the fitness room and under the shower. So these are quite a bit of challenges, and they're, of course, not only on the circuits, they're on the total system, but these are the ones we need to tackle. So let's make a little bit more precise and try to dive for a few minutes into the technical aspects of this and say that we need full ECG streaming, say not just the blip of the heart rate, but really the data that diagnostics um, later on can be done but also we need on-patch diagnostics of, for instance, arrhythmia, of change of heart rhythm. But it needs to be flexible, needs to be stretchable, and fully comfortable for at least seven days. Basically, the only problem we have, power. There's a lot of others, but if you don't solve this, it's never going to fly. So power is essential to the solution of such a health patch. And let's say that we need at least seven days, I guess, between two visits of a doctor or between changing the patch by a nurse coming by, and seven days autonomy on a flexible battery. The exercise you could do, and this is what we did a couple of years ago to start making our first type of device, is that well, let's take off the shelf components, and you see the radio and the microcontroller, uh, the ADC, the commercial uh, power management circuits that work around, say, two volts or so, and, and we brought in the biopotential chip we had ready, and we put that in a package, which is not really a patch. It's, it's a solid package. Um, and we say, well, this is a good start. And you measure the power curve, and you say, well, it's over a million, a milliwatt, average power consumption. Now, this means that you'll have to have a little bit of a battery to have it work for a couple of weeks. And with the existing batteries that fit in such a case, you can indeed have it work for a couple of weeks. But it's not the challenge which I posed a slide ago. What we need to have is consequent generations that will solve the issue of power 
and make it uh, okay for having a flexible battery. And that means that we'll have to run down the power, average power consumption to the level of, say, 50 microwatt. And that will give a seven days autonomy on a, on a current uh, six uh, centimeter squared uh, print battery, printed battery. Of course, this is also going to change and going to evolve. Let's take for a moment that this is where we we're aiming at. Clearly, we'll, we can do this with circuit innovation. And it's quite a bit of papers and sessions again in this conference that will show that there has been improvement on the power consumption of all of these circuits we need. But also, it has to be with the systems approach. And the second part of my talk, I'll talk about scenarios, about use cases, where specifically the systems aspect or the algorithm is going to be uh, distinct, distinct, distilled from, right? It's, it's what we need from these type of scenarios. Okay, so this is the health patch. This is the X-ray of the health patch. And these are the standard components we, we know. And all the ISSC subcommittees recognize what they're working against. First thing to, to understand, of course, is that it's going to be wireless. So we'll need the radio. The best thing you can do with the radio is turn it off. Don't use the radio when you don't need it because it's going to burn power. You're going to convey information over a certain distance. Depending on your application, it's going to be power hungry. So making the radio go to sleep, waking it up when you need it is essential in this. And I'm going to make it easy on myself and just refer to the evening session of later today where, where all the radio aspects are going to be discussed and the standardization and all the issues around that. Um, but just giving you this plot as a sort of a primer to that and saying that, of course, power consumption essentially needs to be tackled, and it has to be uh, done at a certain data rate. So again, it's going to be application dependent, but what we typically see is that on the top part, we have commercial ultra-low power radios that are great in performance, and we see on the bottom part of this, in the lower power regime, quite a bit of research uh, papers that are showing it can be done better, at least by a factor of 10. I would say congratulations to all of us. This is already good, but it needs to improve. And again, the evening session will probably pose new challenges on that. And one of them, of course, is standardization, whether you want it or not, what the type of standards is going to be, going to use an ultra-wideband or narrow band or body channel transmission. All of those are very interesting, and uh, there's, there's some quite some advances in this conference uh, this week again. Streaming full data is a bad idea because your radio has to be on too much of the time. So one of the important things to have on the patch is a microprocessor or a signal processor that converts this biomedical data into information that you can send, and that's going to be less of bits to send over the air. So the, the DSP or microcontroller on the chip is going to be a, a very powerful and a very important uh, element of this patch. Now, without going into detail, I just selected a few slides and a few challenges or a few trends that hopefully uh, or possibly can come back in the panel discussion after that, looking at, uh, at, at micro processing this type of information. And here is a slide uh, showing the uh, 2008 paper. And when I read the abstract, I thought I'll just show this to the audience because typically that gives the challenges. And if you scroll through the, uh, the abstract, it shows that uh, having a very power efficient um, um, processor, you of course need to, fir very first thing to need to do is to carefully select your technology node. If you go too advanced, it's too leaky. So make sure you select one where in the power of mode or in the standby mode, you're not burning too much power. Secondly, of course, you need to make it go to sleep. And a good comprehensive street sleep strategy is what we all need. But also these devices are keen in having that. So this is a very important asset. And then, of course, power gating is introduced to turn down blocks when you don't need them. There is event-driven CPUs, only process when, again, you need to process. And all of these uh, leakage uh, controlling mechanisms, and especially on the memory, are essential for having a successful uh, low power or energy efficient uh, microprocessor. So this sets the stage of this type of, uh, of evolution. And what you see is basically that you turn down the, the supply voltage and you become very good at, ab at doing absolutely nothing. This type of microcontrollers is not performing a lot of tasks. It just performs what you need to perform. And in this particular case, it were 2,000 instructions every 10 minutes or so, and then you can burn, uh, or you're energy efficient, and you burn something like 30 microwatts at the, at the total, 30, uh, at, at total of this, uh, this power consumption. Here's another trend. And because you want to have these uh, devices go to market, it's good to use something which is known out there, rather than going to very application-specific processors that, of course, are very power efficient in the, in the picawatt uh, ranges I showed. 
This one is, uh, is one where you can have an adapted circuit already, but you'll need to change it in a way that your power uh, hungriness is, is going down. And here's a case where accelerators are used for specific functions which are essential for the type of algorithms that you'll be processing in this biomedical sphere. And an example that was shown here is using these accelerators, the FIR, for instance, which is very important, and the median uh, calculation, which is very important for the e e ECG algorithm. And it was shown that if you run such an uh, ECG algorithm on such a processor, you can have a power reduction by a factor of 10 compared to the standard CPU. So that's a, a very interesting trend. Now here's another one that's going to, a little bit of commercial here is going to be uh, published or, or presented later this conference where we used a, a, a DSP. So we had our collaboration with NXP and, and used their cool bio, uh, their cool flux DSP and turned it into a cool bio DSP by, um, by using the wavelet processing, which is important for this biomedical uh, signal processing, and we optimized the memory access. So that could be a trend as well to, to start using the DSP with all its advantages for signal processing and turn the knobs into a system that it's becoming uh, low power. And the essential elements, of course, are the cool flux. And you can see that's a little bit more programmable already because you can access a number of different devices and you can build your application and you can tune it and, and, and reconfigure or reprogram your, your chip, which is good because then you can tackle a larger market segment and the cost goes down and you have more uh, access to, to different types of, of applications. Now, what we know and what we hear in the community talking uh, about these scenarios is that the algorithms that you will put on such a patch are becoming increasingly more complex. And this complexity, of course, then leads to much powerful processors and, and having more instructions and more memory access on that chip. And typically, if you want to do this, this, uh, this power computation efficiently, you'd like to follow the next generation of CMOS nodes. The most advanced technology is better for active power, as we know. Of course, it comes with leakage. It comes with all of these uh, this, this variability problems. So again, I hope the, the panel can shed some light on, on future. But a future system also for, for biomedical could look like this, where you have an architecture that uh, net networks on chip a number of blocks that are specifically good at performing certain tasks and certain functions and certain applications. But in this network, they, have, they are like a, a full instruction set processor for a number of domains. And these domains could be biomedical, but maybe also cover some applications in areas which are outside of the biomedical, such that the market size is big enough and we can get the economics of scale working for these type of processors. This is a view of some of our colleagues, and, and again, maybe the panel says this is a good or bad idea, but at least we can get some discussion going. And the good thing is, and I'm a device person myself, that it links to the community, which is equally large, but looking at the technology itself. So maybe there is a trend that the ISSC and IDM can think and sit together and see where we can tweak the transistor level towards ultra-low power performance. So microprocessors there, so we have the information. The question is, where does it come from? And it comes from the body. And so one of the key components I'd like to address in the, in the next few minutes is accessing the information from the body and having the instrumentation amplifier taking that towards the ADC. An important challenge for the health patch, of course, is that it's on the body. So we have allergies, potentially. We'll have to deal with motion artifacts. We'll have a high impedance, and the signal-to-noise ratio, again, also there, is a chance. Here's an interesting message, which some patients may not want to hear, and definitely in the day-to-day -day setting, it's some, not something we want to go for. But if you want to have high quality, you'll better go for implant if it's applicable. And why is that? Well, the next few graphs probably uh, shows that a little bit more clear. And it's, it says when you move into the body, starting from, say, the left-hand side on the, on the skin, and you move into the body, as Tim showed, there's, um, there's implants there, and the signal quality, the signal amplitude is just better inside. <coughs> So we'll have to deal with a lower signal amplitude, but also we'll have to deal with the higher impedance on the skin and the skin effects. And so the instrumentation amplifier that typically goes to the, to the left-hand side uh, of, this, uh, of this graph has to tackle, uh, has to optimize quite a few often competing characteristics. Going technical just a little bit, this is uh, sort of the, the ballpark of instrumentation amplifiers specifically for this type of application. And before you start analyzing these block diagrams, let me just say that on the uncompensated version, um, there is a very popular type of uh, instrumentation amplifier for implants. 
And the top line there is for um, wearable applications. And it's a, it's a developing, and also here in this conference again, there's a lot of discussion most likely on how to improve this type of instrumentation amplifiers. And the target specs are, again, as I mentioned, a little bit uh, contradictory sometimes. I'd like to have the supply voltage going down, which is a challenge, of course, for analog. You'd like to have the number of external components to be limited because you want to integrate it in a patch, for instance. The CMRR and the input impedance are challenges, the DC filtering range, and finally, of course, the total noise. Put this spider plot into perspective of these three uh, circuits I, I mentioned, we see that some of them are doing well in, um, in, in one type of characteristics, others are doing better in the others, and there's a little bit of competition. But I guess that this slide is a very um, interesting slide for the committee to select papers next year, because if they, don't, if they don't meet the target blue dotted line, that's probably not fit for, for publication. So let's see whether this target is going to be met in the, in the years to come and try to maximize the surface area in this, uh, in this plot that you can see on the screen. Where are we today? So with all these circuits and with all the, the evolution in, in circuit optimization, it's probably fair to say that the time frame ISSC 2011, we are close to, say, 100 microwatts. So really close to to be able to, to make such a patch work for, for seven days in a row. And um, there will be some, some evolution still to make sure that this goes down. And listening to the evening session yesterday, the challenge was to to get from the microwatt even into the nanowatt. So I, I hope that, uh, that again there we'll see some interesting uh, evolutions coming up. So that is happening. And, and what is driving that or what is, uh, what is probably the changes that we will see in this uh, circuit is improved power management for sure because the lower the power, the tougher it is to do uh, good power management from the battery to the user. We probably see also some, uh, some instances where we can do the analog pre-processing on the patch, staying in the analog domain when the signal quality is good enough, trying to alleviate the processing power in the digital domain. And also the motion artifacts can be tackled uh, in the analog domain sometimes. And there's many other circuits innovations that we will see, but we'll also see a system challenge so even if we drive down the circuit uh, power consumption, the systems guys will come in and say, well, I need more complex algorithms, so can you do this for me and that and additionally something else. So this patch will become quite a bit of a, a powerful compute uh, engine uh, for, for tackling all of these different algorithms. So there'll be a lot of challenge to come even if we tackle today the seven days uh, power consumption for ECG. There's good news, of course, in another community that is taking care of the... Uh, the battery and the energy harvesting. And also uh, yesterday on the, on the session, we had some, some interesting discussion on where this battery technology is going and how energy harvesting can help us in uh, making a better, uh, a better uh, power management and also a better power uh, level on these, on, these, uh, on these applications. And so battery capacity will go up and we'll see energy harvesting in some applications uh, come up and I'll give a slide later to set the scene for that. So we're pretty much there, I think, in, in the components, and I, I missed a few like the ADC and the specific circuits of the power management, but again, we have a full week to tackle and, and to listen to, uh, to tackle that problem and to listen to the evolution there. Let's just see how we can integrate that. Because there are some challenges beyond making the circuit, and that's in integration. And as Tim also shown, uh, a very nice example of integrating in 3D different functionalities of MEMS devices. Here for the patch, we have another one, which is a low-cost, fully flexible and stretchable one. And if you follow this animation, you can see that when we, have to, when we have to have a stretchable or flexible interconnect, our interconnect is going to have a meander shape. We're going to integrate on foil, and there we do ultra-thin chip stacking, or we, we make the chip so thin that really become flexible, a technology which is uh, getting known in the 3D integration, so we'll have to do that on foil. And then by embossing that in a, in a silicone polymer, for instance, we can make this type of patch flexible and stretchable the way that it brings more comfort to the patient. So this is the way that uh, such a prototype can look. And you see, uh, if you look at, uh, at the graph, that, uh, that this is the meander interconnect to the electrode. And this is a flexible antenna circuit or antenna implementation that finally leads to an implementation that you can see here, excuse me, where you have this, uh, this patch uh, ready for trials and testing on the body. Over the past year, we've seen others, like here in the ICC of, uh, of last year, implementation of 
of functionality for vital sign measurement on the uh, underbody, for instance, here in a poultice work from KAIST. And textile integration is, uh, is a key enabling technology as well for uh, some applications of ambulatory monitoring where, again, the comfort of the user is essential. Now, this is not fully, fully flexible yet, and there is definitely something happening out there in a different technology platform which is worthwhile watching. And I'm very pleased to see that also here in this conference we, had, we have a session on, on uh, technology uh, development or technology directions that is aiming at a technology platform which is emerging, and that is the one of plastic uh, electronics or systems in foil where we'll start using organic or oxide transistors that can be implemented on such a foil. And if you just reflect, uh, say, uh, 1970s, we had a circuit on silicon that performs sort of like uh, first microprocessor uh, functionality. So we're witnessing in this conference the first microprocessor on plastic. And let's see how, in the evolution of things, uh, this room starts filling up with designers that are designing on plastic. And so maybe in 20 years' time, half of the room there will be doing it on silicon, and the other half will be doing it on plastic and see how that, uh, how that moves. Probably we're thinking 20, 30, 40 years ahead. Okay, let's give us some time. But that is typically also the time that the silicon circuitry had, and so that's, uh, that's okay. Let's look at the same Anna time frame. Anna is pregnant. At the, at the same time frame at the future. Before she leaves for work, she has her weekly checkup in the comfort of her home. So this is Hannah, 2030. And she's in her bathroom. She's pregnant. And she's doing some, some tests, and she has to interface with her doctor. Thank you, Hannah. I've successfully received your health parameters for June 9th. Your iron is a bit low, but nothing to worry about. Eat some iron-rich food in the next few weeks, and everything will be fine with you and the baby. See you next week. So Hannah is in good shape, and she interfaced with her doctor. And Hannah is a typical example, I would say, of, of the worried well. People like us that typically are doing okay, but we'll need some coaching. We need a checkup, and uh, we don't want to go to the doctor's office because, of course, we're too busy. So in our daily pattern of, say, 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, this is one example. This is an interesting target group to worry well, because typically these patients are not in a stressful position. But there are other target groups, and, and here's one of the independently aging. Some of them are doing fine. They're fully healthy and fit and traveling the world. Others may have a situation that need uh, more acute monitoring, and others live a very solitary life. And also they need and they are entitled to good coaching and nursing and health care. So how are we tackling this, uh, this, tackle, this uh, target group? And there's another one, the one that I introduced uh, in the beginning, is the one of the network patients. So there we have scenarios in the home, I would say, and this is now the, the, the questions we have to ask ourselves, what are these scenarios? So given the fact that sometimes we know what to measure, we can do it well. We can do cardio manage, uh, measurements, we can do blood pressure management, temperature, weight, bioparameters sometimes, can, do, can be done well, and there's a couple of circuits and devices that are coming out there that you can buy that will do exactly those type of measurements. The Continual Health Alliance is doing a good job in trying to make all of these devices interoperable. And some of the devices on the slide are still you know, battery powered and they won't be fully portable, not in a way that you carry them around all day. So ambulatory uh, challenges definitely are there and it's gonna be part of the total solution. But measuring a single parameter is one thing, but if you really want to understand what's happening, if you want to know what is the, the scenario, you need to uh, try to measure or at least interpret something more complex. Like, for instance, is the diet of a person, a person okay? Is he or she sleeping well? What is the activity? What is the social contact or hygiene situation? And a very important one, bottom of the list, but I think top priority, is uh, medication compliance. So people are sent off with prescription drugs, but do they take the drugs? Are they compliant with the drug taking? And also there is a very important scenario that can save a lot of lives and also a lot of money. And then finally, there's the next phase is uh, whether the patient is stressful or relaxed, whether they're depressed or feeling fine, and what's on their mind. Now, this is uh, a challenging uh, area, so let's take a look first at more simple scenarios, ones that are developing currently. And here's an interesting statistic is that 13.5 um, million people over 65 years old will fall this year. And some of them will be very benign and some of them will be alone at home and need some 
urgent assistance. And of course, we know that this is out there. This is happening. We see, for instance, uh, the Lifeline from Philips and, and, and Qualcomm is, is putting the Lifecom out there. And typically, the challenge there is to measure not EKG, that's what one of the drivers we had in the beginning, but is measuring fall and not the fall of the pendulum of, or the medallion, but the fall of the person. So you'll need an algorithm on board that detects from detects, detects from uh, acceleration or movement what exactly has happened. And then, of course, sends a message out to the caretaker that, uh, or caregiver that can bring uh, help or rescue to this type of situation. Battery lifetime, typically more than a year. We don't want to, in this case, bother with changing batteries every time or every day or every week or having recharging. So typically, battery, primary battery re uh, replacement will be done uh, over more than a year. Here's another interesting one, and, and we had uh, the, the, uh, the nice video in the previous presentation of somebody that needs to be monitored on, on walking, gait, or movement. Parkinson is, a, is, is one of those examples where, where gait control or movement or activity control are very important to see the evolution of the disease in the patient. Here's an interesting challenge, the, the Lego Mindshare, and it, uh, it used the Providencia suite of Intel's sensors, and uh, it, it, uh, it was programmed by, by fourth and sixth graders to, uh, to monitor or measure the foot rolling or the foot shuffling. Um, it's a nice example for many reasons. Uh, I think for one, on a, on, a, on a side note here, if you can have sixth graders program such a thing and see the impact of that type of work, maybe it's a good motivation for the youngsters to become engineers and, 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 and fill this room in the coming years. But that's on a sidetrack, so it's very exciting to see what's happening there. But these sensors and this type of monitoring can also be done in a different way. And that's very important for us to, to see and, and to understand what is the real scenario. Because in the home, you can also watch a person move. You can also do some sort of gate control with sensors in the environment. And I think that's an important message to take home is that it's not necessarily only on the body, it's on the body and in the environment. And one important aspect of that in the environment is also monitoring uh, the, the tension, the stress, and the activity. I'll come back to that in a second and just give this example first because this, it's a tricky one. How do you measure somebody's feeling or mood or emotion or stress? Here's one, one prototype, a research prototype. It's called the discrete tension indicator that uses the skin conductance, which is an indication of immediate stress level, and it also uses accelerometer and activity measurement. And there's a complex algorithm on board that has to distill from these different parameters what is actually happening in terms of stress or, or tension. It uses this, uh, this Coolflux uh, DSP in the current prototype and we sort of calculate it back of the envelope and if we can do the uh, innovation that we'll present in the ISSC this year, it'll move from 30 hours of, of uh, autonomy to about a week. So it's one example to, to show that immediate progress can be made by using the, the right uh, circuitry approach. But I mentioned the environment when I discussed the gate control and the activity of, of a person. Here's something else. Uh, the environment is, is full of volatiles, uh, full of gases, and also your body is, uh, is, is giving out, for instance, in breath, a lot of uh, volatiles and gas. And the technology out there is trying, uh, for a long time already, mimic the electronic nose, mimic the nose as, as we have it to sense and to, to discriminate between different gases and to understand whether it's a hazard coming up or whether you're okay in your environment. This is the technical part of things. I'm not going to dwell on that, but there are different technology platforms evolving on, based on CMOS, based on, on MEMS, or based on capacitive ultrasound, and there's many others out there. But typically, what you'd like to measure, and for the chemists in the room, you can read the white line, which is showing the different gases or speci species or, or chemistry that you can, can actually measure with these type of components. But on the yellow line, you can see that you can either measure bad breath, which is interesting to know, but also you can measure infection or metabolic disorders or cancer or tuberculosis, which in some cases is going to be essential to find out. And of course, also the environment. Think of an asthma patient that uh, is warned by the fact that there's pollen in the air, so he or she better stay at home or find another environment. And you see that there's scenarios developing where these type of sensors, either close to the body or in the environment, can bring a total use scenario that is improving our, uh, our situation. Challenge, of course, is to do that integration of this type of functionality in a cost-effective manner in, for instance, a patch or a platform like the patch which I mentioned. Let's consider a few of these what I would call sentinel platforms or watchdog platforms. 
platforms that take this type of sensors and circuits and make sure that the scenario starts to, uh, to develop. We discussed the patch. We discussed the watch. We looked at the pendulum or medallion, but you'll find these chips in the coming years and decades in very strange places. For instance, here in medication. Now, here's a smart pill that will tell us whether, yes or no, the uh, medication has been taken. Not by any intervention of the, the patient uh, himself, but just by the fact that it's in the body, it's being digested, and at the moment that happens, the signal goes out to the patch on the skin and from the patch on the skin to the mobile phone and from the mobile phone to the end user, the end user being medical doctor or nurse. So this information flow is, is then autonomously happening without the patient uh, being aware even. And this leads to a medication compliance scenario, which is very interesting and which I mentioned will save lives and, and, could, uh, and definitely will save a lot of uh, US dollars or euros or yen, as you have. Here's another one. Scary, I would think. It's, it's not really an implant. It's, it's sort of like an on-plant. Eh? And, uh, and you see that uh, pressure monitoring can be done on the eye and that uh, these type of circuits need a very challenging integration technology. Here's a shirt that monitors the ECG and where energy harvesting is going to be essential. And we're running out of energy here, so I'll speed up for a few of these scenarios where we see that energy is, is essential and taking energy from the environment is very important and light is going to be one of the key features. And then moving to the brain, the final frontier, understanding the brain through implant or to this type of uh, on-skull measurements. And this young lady is focusing on an event that uh, is changing her life and you can see that uh, she's focusing on the, on the computer screen and interacts just by thinking and she spells out this, uh, this uh, life-changing event as you can see, it uh, is passed by. And we are using the, the more advanced headsets with tri-electrodes to also go into clinical setting and see how, for instance, in epilepsy patients, we can use this type of, uh, of monitoring devices. The important medical device of the future is going to be the phone. And let me say just a few words, if Wanda allows, to show that this platform is going to be very, very important. The phone is going to be the gateway of the service, and you find a lot of applications already today in the medical field to see how, I, how you are, how is your control, the pollution, how the medication compliance is happening, and the stress level is evolving. Very important for our day-to-day -day life in a, in a setting where we have medical infrastructure. But just think of this. If you look at the developing areas, the coverage of cell phone is very high. And just this is the opportunity to move this type of healthcare into the area where there's no infrastructure for healthcare today. And the final interesting characteristic, I would say, if you look at the number of medical doctors per thousand people, and you look at the cell phone coverage per thousand people or cell phone use, in 1975, there was no cell phones, but if evolving over the, the, the past years and the past decade, we see that there's a proliferation of cell phones also in those areas where there's no growth in medical infrastructure. And this is a very, very interesting uh, opportunity, we believe, to see healthcare move in these places and do the monitoring of heart, of diseases, of breath, of dermatology in all of these devices that are coming out. So let's use the cell phone to its maximum and see that we can enter new functions and new scenarios in or around the body or in this platform to uh, come finally to a healthcare for everyone, everyone everywhere. Having affordable access, of course, to the internet and text messaging, covering the whole ICT is going to be essential there. And this is a final slide to reiterate the fact that we are moving really into this era of preventive, predictive, personal, and very participatory healthcare. And yes, there is a market, so that's important. The economics are correct. But there's also a social impact that's going to be unparalleled if you do this thing uh, right, and we can really change the game. So. Um, I would like to, to thank, of course, my colleagues that are with me on, on, this, on this journey. This conference is going to be very interesting to see this field move. And uh, thanks for the committee for having this, uh, this opportunity. And so have a good ISSC and a very healthy continuation. Thank you so much.